All right, everybody, we're going to give it a few more seconds, about a minute here. We're going to get started, letting everybody get joined in. And this is Avril once again. Let's give it about another 15 seconds or so and we'll get started. Make sure everybody gets in before we start and put the information out. <clears throat> okay, can anybody hear me? Somebody acknowledge me so I know I'm coming through. Uh, I can hear you fine, Avril. Go ahead okay. and start. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm glad that you uh, took your time tonight to get on the call with us. Uh, we have some guests here, some panelists who are going to uh, help me to conduct this call. Uh, on the line also with us is uh, Fred Zuckerman, General Secretary Treasurer, Jeff Risky, Prilsky, uh, Assistant Director of Car Hall, and Chris Taylor, who's the lead negotiator for Driveway. Also on our call is Caitlin Long, the economists that uh, sit through the entire negotiation with us helped us to find out the facts on the financials of the company. Uh, General President Sean O'Brien is going to make an attempt. He's busy. He's going to try to get in on the call also, and we'll recognize him when he does uh, get on. As you are aware, we began this process to negotiate a new NMATA on March 22nd. We immediately began gathering proposals from our members, screening those proposals, having a two-person review and beginning negotiations with a proposal exchange on April 27th. Then spent 16 days with our 21-person negotiating committee, getting to the tentative agreement you have before you now. We were able to secure changes you have uh, in the contract that you are viewing with us tonight. Our entire negotiating committee and the entire two-person review committee which was held on June 16th at the IBT, have endorsed this package. We were able to secure many improvements to the contract that we were never able to get before. This package is packed full of changes that will make our members' lives better. We cannot cover all these improvements on this call tonight, but I ask that you please visit IBT.org and take the time to watch the video posted there with contract information. We'll be, we will be adding this call and another video within the next couple of days for your review. Voting will begin on June 27th. You will be receiving voting information at your home. Please monitor your local bulletin boards for information or contact your local unions if you have not received an access code by Tuesday, July the 5th. Tabulation of votes will occur on July the 12th. Uh, I would like to start this segment of the call off by addressing some of the concerns that have been brought to my attention uh, since the information on the contract has been put out. Uh, before I do that, I think I would like to acknowledge uh, General Secretary Treasurer Fred Zuckerman and see if you have any comments uh, before I begin my explanation. I do, Avril, and thank you. Can you hear me all right? Yes, sir. Are you fine? All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and thank you, everybody, for being on the call. Uh, first of all, I want to congratulate the committee, uh, Avril, Jeff, Chris, uh, and particularly the rank and file committee members who spent the better part of March or uh, the better part of May uh, negotiating this contract. Uh, I think it's a very solid contract. When you hear what was negotiated in it. There's a lot of changes to it, a lot of positive changes that are gonna make uh, it much better for our members and hopefully put us on a path to be able to get out there and organize because that's one of our main priorities right now is when we get the contract uh, ratified, we're gonna get out and start organizing these non-union companies, which is gonna make the jobs and the lives better for our existing members. I have seen a lot of chatter out there on uh, social media. And one of the things I wanna address because I was part of it many, many years ago was Article 22. And I think everybody 
uh, who is uh, talking about it on social media. I think it would be best to understand what Article 22 does and how it can be changed and how it can be eliminated, quite frankly, if a uh, local union wanted to eliminate it. As I had explained when Article 22 was first put in the contract, uh, we have a mechanism in Article 22 where the union side of the National Grievance Committee can eliminate Article 22, make modifications to it, do what's necessary. As I explained many years ago when it was first put in the contract that if a local union did not wanna participate in Article 22, they could file a grievance, take it to the committee and the committee can eliminate Article 22. I will tell you that that would be counterproductive. I believe that Article 22 provides many jobs in many locations uh, and many work opportunities for our members, which is very important because they can use Article 22 to compete and take away traffic from non-union carriers. The other thing that's extremely important is over the years, Article 22 was not paid correctly. Now, Avril and the committee know the proper payment method of Article 22, and that is if there is an intermediate trip or a third leg on a trip, it's always the shortest leg that gets paid at the Article 22 rate. Now, Local 89 has had grievances over the past, and we got some rulings that, quite frankly, were uh, different than what the contract states. And I believe that Avril is going to put, uh, you know, uh, make sure that everybody gets paid correctly, because if they don't get paid correctly, if they don't get paid the shortest leg on the trip, he's got a right to deadlock it and just take Article 22 away from the committee or away from the company. So again, I want to thank the committee. Uh, I want to thank everybody for being on the call. And I certainly want to thank the rank and file committee members who participated in the negotiation because it was very important for the rank and file negotiators to see what happens in negotiations and participate and give their experiences to the committee that quite frankly, uh, you know, gets lost in negotiations. So thank you very much and uh, uh, good luck to everybody. Avril. Okay, thank you, Fred. Can you hear me now? I hear you fine. Okay, so I'm going to carry on. So what I would like to do, as I said, I want to run through uh, the topics that have been brought to me and discuss them a bit. Maybe it will answer some questions for our brothers and sisters that are out there uh, listening so that uh, it, it may answer their question where they don't have to ask us here tonight. Uh, if we don't get your questions asked, please feel free to contact me, uh, send me an email, send it to the division. Uh, I responded to an email today and I'll be glad to try to to help you to clarify the, the language. So the first topic that I probably should talk about, and Fred did it too, but I want I had some notes on it I want to bring up and talk about Article 22. So Article 22 is big, without a doubt. We do understand the issues with Article 22, but we also understand the issues that may be caused by elimination of it as well. We have at least one location where 40% of its business is Article 22. Most of the other locations that I've uh, been able to get information on have between 10 and 15% of their work at a certain terminal would be Article 22. If this article were eliminated in its entirety, it would cause driver layoff and may result in closing of, of some terminals. We are committed to fixing the problem under Article 22 with Section 8. If you will take uh, the time to look at Section 8 tonight after we get off this call, you'll see that uh, it's what Fred had spoke about. Uh, the current contract allows us to do, uh, the companies have been put on notice that <clears throat> grievances that come to the committee on 22 will be deadlocked and that rate for that traffic will become null and void. This gives the local union the hammer to fix the issues at given locations without killing jobs everywhere. So I think what Fred said is very important and that's the way I would like to to present it to you is that if you're having problems in a location and we have grievances filed over it, the company is going to have to fix those issues because if they come to our committee, uh, my panelists, my, my co-chair have been instructed that Article 22 cases are going to be deadlocked and then 
uh, the company loses out. And I, I don't think that they want to push it that far. I believe that we can get our intermediate load issues and stuff fixed without uh, killing all our, our 22 jobs out there because some people, uh, their, their lives or their jobs depend on it. Article 33 is another issue that has been brought to my attention that uh, got caused and was asked to talk about. So if you look in the contract, you'll see that we put a third party service agreement uh, added into the contract. As you know, uh, we have got one company that has been going around the country to different locals and negotiating uh, uh, PT agreements, purchase transportation agreements with them. And some, uh, most of those purchase transportation agreements are, were actually needed. And they probably, they are actually working well in those locations. Uh, I had been a proponent of PT from the very beginning, didn't think it was a good idea. And when I got involved in these negotiations and listened to my to my co-committee members from around the country, I found that it's, it's a valuable tool. Uh, we put it in the contract. This was done to prevent local unions from negotiating agreements with the company, which may violate drivers from other locations, such as backhaul rights under Article 48. Lately, there has been a push by one company in particular to negotiate local by local. Our attorneys, who were also at our, our side during the entire negotiation process, recognized this was a huge issue, and the negotiating committee agreed that with the current condition of the industry, a third-party service agreement was necessary. The IBT attorneys wrote this agreement that you see that appears now in Article 33. If you read through it, you will see that this is a temporary fix to address driver shortage. It is triggered by an overflow of work that the employer cannot handle and is in jeopardy of losing to non-union carriers. And that happens when the, the OEMs just pick up a piece of work and give it, give it to a non-union. At the same time, the employer must be hiring at the location and nobody is on layoff. When all this criteria is met, the local union will be allowed by the car hall division to negotiate an agreement for that location. That agreement will be forwarded to the division for approval. No agreement will be accepted that allows for a non-union union company to be loading on Teamster Yard. That's very important. And as far as I know, every PT agreement that's out there prior to this, uh, the local unions have negotiated that, that this uh, purchase transportation work is loaded off-site, not on a plant site or not on a Teamster site. No agreement will be accepted to violate someone's right to a backhaul. During the negotiations, <clears throat> the local unions can attempt to negotiate things such as truck speed and any other uh, specific item for their location that they need. The company will provide reports monthly to the local union and the division of and and, a, and the division of all the units hauled. And the division can cancel any TPS agreement upon seven day notice. So this will allow the local unions to know what they need in their area. Uh, it will only be triggered to start working when the local union acknowledges and sees that they are in jeopardy of, of being overran by non-unions or by an OEM picking up part of their good traffic, which we've had happen in a certain area of the country and giving it to a non-union. I understand the issues with this and I was originally totally against it, but it has been a very good tool in a few locations. It has kept our drivers the ability to haul the preferential loads and allows the company to control all the freight from a location. We do not want the manufacturers to turn into logistics companies. They will give away our best freight to non-unions. After many hours of discussion, this committee believes that this will be a good tool for the industry. We control what loads the third parties get. We keep the good loads and give away the undesirable and the third parties units must be loaded on an offsite yard. And as I said, uh, this first step of this negotiation is up to the local union to gain whatever they think they need to, to solidify and to, to secure their drivers at that location. <clears throat> so, that is our position on 33, and that is why we decided to 
the attorneys wanted to put it in the contract so that everybody could see it and it would not be a memorandum of agreement. The next item that has been brought to my attention that I was asked to talk about is Article 48. <clears throat> Article 48, you know, as we all know, that's been in Car Hall is, is probably the, uh, the most controversial article in the contract to, to try to change either way. In past, there has been uh, changes made to it. We can all remember when there was forced redomicile, uh, we finally got that taken out of the contract and uh, for good reason. This time the company came back and were, you know, they were heading down the same path for negotiations. The changes that were made help our drivers in two ways. One is by allowing them to increase their pay by getting paid full rate on all loads by completing four trips after dispatch from your home. This will also help to alleviate our need for third party service agreements in hotspots, as I just talked about, when we have an overflow of traffic. Uh, this will, Article 48 change will help to alleviate that. And I'll try to, I'll try to explain it to you the way I have done with my people here at Local 89 and our meeting Saturday. So <clears throat> on the first two days of the, the dispatch week only, the first two days. So if you start on Sunday, it'd be Sunday, Monday. Uh, otherwise, it'd be Monday, Tuesday. Uh, the company can mark 25% of the total loads as a category one or category two. So that means they could have 12% category one, 13% category two, or 25% either way. So if I had two scenarios that drivers brought to me, one is on one end of the spectrum and the, and the other is on the other, which is a pretty good example. So I'm gonna to try to put that to you. So if five loads are placed out for dispatch on Monday morning, dispatch, uh, <clears throat> uh, one of the loads can be either a category one or a category two. Dispatch begins and if not picked, the bottom man gets the category load, just like what happens now. However, if four drivers show up, no one has to pick the category load. So the language says that it can be made hot or, or must goes. So if you are able to pick around them, you can, is what that language says. Uh, so like I said, if there's five loads, four drivers show up, you don't have to pick it. Another driver asked, what if they put out 200 loads and 50 or category, category loads, either one or two, which they would be able to do. 50 is 25% of 200. So if they did that, that would mean that more than 150 domicile drivers would have to come in before anyone was required to take a category one or two load. So that's what everybody needs to understand because they put out 25% of them does not mean that, that anybody would be forced on it every day. It just depends on how many loads they put out. So depending on whether you're at a terminal that requires all loads put out on the morning dispatch or you're at a terminal like here in Louisville where they have time dispatches uh, is gonna make a difference on how many loads they put out. Now, if you pick a category one load on the first two days of the dispatch week, you will be required to go into a terminal when you get empty from that load and pick, which is very important, I believe, you get to pick off the bottom of that board, a load away from the home terminal. Once you complete that load, then you can require the company to load you home or at that point you can pick away again and then get a home load. When you get four loads under your belt after leaving your home terminal, you get full rate for all load, loaded miles. So if you're a, a Louisville driver that heads out of KTP on an Article 22 load into Michigan uh, on a category one load, when you get empty, you pick away going towards Chicago or wherever you're gonna go. You get empty, you pick away again, and you go into Fort Wayne. And when you come home, that Article 22 load to Michigan just became full rate because you pulled you pulled four legs. <clears throat> but remember, it's your choice. After that one trip away, you can require the company to send you back home. the The four trip is is an incentive to get drivers to go out and pull another load. And when you do it, you're you're increasing your earning capacity because you're changing 22s and frozen rates into full rate. 
Now, if you pick a category two trip on a Monday or Tuesday, you will load out of your terminal, get empty, and be sent into a nearby terminal to pull two loads of 250 and 150 max. Then get a load home and all those miles paid full rate. This number two is specifically aimed at getting a driver into a hot spot to get a load, to get a lift and attempt to avoid a temporary third party agreement. If you arrive at the category two terminal on a Thursday, you would only be required to pull one load, then a home load. And all three of these uh, loads will pay full rate. So if you look at that, it says if they dispatch you on a number two on a Tuesday, and for whatever reason, you don't get to the category two terminal for your back hauls until Thursday, you pull one load out, go back to that terminal and get your home load and all those miles are paid at full rate. <clears throat> Both these articles are designed to get drivers back to their home terminal before the weekend. And let's not forget, this only applies to 25% of your home domiciled loads. But anyone can benefit from this by pulling four legs after leaving their home domicile. So even if you're not a, a category one or a category two guy when you leave your home domicile, if you get out in the system and, and decide that you can pull one more load before you go back home and it makes you get four, then you would get full rate all the way through too. Now let's talk about another subject brought to my attention. Uh, Article 59, section 1B, shopping of trucks. So, you know, this is a pretty interesting topic too. Uh, I have drivers in the past come, come to me and tell me, uh, I don't want to have to wait and give the company 24 hours of my time unpaid while waiting on a truck when no spares are available. So there's that side of the, of the coin too. When the company came with this proposal to eliminate the 24 hour rule, <clears throat> we as a committee said, then pay the drivers when you have no spares. If you look at the change to this article, the company proposed to strike the 24 and 48 hours. We countered with, if no roadworthy equipment is available, the daily guarantee applies. Uh, the key word in our counter is roadworthy. And we made it very clear to the companies that drivers are not required to drive equipment that is not roadworthy uh, equipment. So they are the topics that, that I had that people wanted me to address. Uh, I hope that answers some of the questions that are out there. And I think now, Amanda, uh, that we could open up and uh, take some questions if there's any out there. We've got a couple. Um, Edgar's asking if you could explain more the work preservation and if companies are allowed to subcontract their work out. Okay, be glad to try try to do that. I don't guess, uh, yeah, our attorneys are on the on the line tonight, but I do understand what this means. The companies are the the problem here, Edgar, is what we're running into. As you may know, you've probably seen it uh, with part shortages and quality holds and all the issues that we run into with auto manufacturers. We get a a, a lot of units on offsite yards. When that happens, we're in danger because uh, the manufacturer will come by on a Tuesday and wave their magic wand. And now all of a sudden those units are, are ready to ship and they want them gone tomorrow. Oh my God. So the problem is that we have uh, our, our board at that location is, is overwhelmed and we're in jeopardy of the manufacturer just picking up uh, like a certain state, a geographical area, like uh, in the Texas area and take it away from a, a plant in Ohio, uh, their primo traffic, they're taking it away and giving it to non-unions and sometimes actually paying more just to get the stuff moved because uh, we're over, we're overloaded. So yes, uh, what this article 33 does is it allows our unionized companies to be a, a one-stop shop so that our manufacturers know that they can count on Jack Cooper to move all their traffic. And the, the, the agreements that we were seeing negotiated 
we have our stewards involved in dispatch each day. They're monitoring what trips are being put on our trucks and making sure that our guys are getting the best paying loads. Uh, and the stuff that is short and doesn't pay good is what we're wanting to purchase transportation away. Uh, it, it's a it's a tool that we can use until we can get back on top of the industry, and uh, I think that uh, we do need to we do need that part of the contract at this point just to try to to hold our own out there. I hope that answers your question. If it didn't, if you want something more specific, you can you can ask, and I'll try to help you out with it. Okay, we had another question. It looks like somebody asked if you could explain the raises. Is it just the 9%, 5%, and 4%? Yeah, it, 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 uh, it depends on which supplement you're working under. Uh, the raises are for Central Southern uh, truckaway guys or 9, 5, and 4. Uh, that applies to the hourly rate, it, it applies to the mileage rate, uh, such as under the central, the uh, central southern right now, the mileage rate is $1.32 and the 9% increase makes it go to $1.44. At the end of the three-year agreement, it'll be $1.57. Uh, the hourly rate currently for drivers in the central southern is $26.18. It'll go to $28.54. And at the end of three years, it'll be $31.17. Uh, that 9% applies to flat rates, uh, it applies to zone rates, it applies to loading and unloading uh, derivatives as well. Uh, I've got a, I actually got a copy of a, a load, uh, it's a load out of Detroit for 235 miles with nine units and three skid drops. Uh, currently it pays 379 with this new increase, it'll pay 413. So it's about, uh, what, $40, 13, about $40 increase on a load. Just the first year. Okay, any more? Yep, we've got a couple that actually they wanted to know who or what would determine if the equipment was considered roadworthy. Good question. Good question. So the driver, the driver, uh, when they give you a spare, you will pre-trip that truck and find it, find if it's roadworthy. Now, the other day, one of my guys said, you know, what if, what if it smells bad? Is that, is that roadworthy? I mean, uh, you know, if it, if it smells bad, it may need to be cleaned out, but it doesn't keep it from going down the road. If it's got a crack in the frame, uh, the driver can shop that truck. If it's got bad tires, if it's got leaking seals, if it's got uh, cracked windshields, you know, that kind of stuff that uh, DOT would have a problem with that on the road. The driver does a good pre-trip. And if it's not roadworthy in his eyes, he writes that truck up. And and then we would, you know, I'm sure the company would, if the company would take an issue with it, they'd have to deal with the local union. But everybody, Every driver knows what a roadworthy truck is. Any more questions? Okay, yeah, there's a lot of chatter. If you could describe like the category one and category two <clears throat> loads. Okay. Okay, so a category one load is a load that you pick off your home board. And when you get empty off of that load, you would be required to go into a nearby terminal and pick off of their board of loads that had went through their board, okay. pick off the bottom of their board and pick one load away. Upon completing that one load away, you can require the company to send you back home or you can pick away again and pull four legs before you come home and all those loaded miles pay full rate, right? That's a category one. The category two is you would pick it from your home terminal, take a load going towards, if you're in Louisville area and they give you a category two uh, towards Winsfield, Missouri, because they're overran, you would take a load into Missouri, get empty. They would send you into Winsfield. 
you would pull one load away of 250 miles, go back, pull one load away of 150 miles or less and go back and get your home load and come home and all those miles pay full rate. And that is directed totally at trying to get a lift at a location where we're in, we're uh, worried about losing traffic to non-unions. Okay, and I think they're kind of looking if you can clarify if you're saying the company would pick their category or would it be like what determined what a company would consider category like one or two? Okay, okay, good. That's a good question too. So yes, the company will get to, to say what is a category one or two and, and what they're what the, the idea behind it is they know that they have uh, they have a problem in Winsville or they have a problem in Fort Wayne. I'm gonna use my geography. So the Louisville dispatch would be would be told, look, we got a problem in in Fort Wayne, or we got a problem in Wentzville. So put build loads going towards Fort Wayne or Wentzville, and make them a category either one or two. That way, when that person picks that load going towards Fort Wayne, they're going to know they're going into 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 Fort Wayne when they get empty to pull load one away or pull two and then come back home, depending on whether it's one or two, right? So the whole idea of determining the category would be what they need at a different location to try to uh, get out of the out of the soup if they're struggling with the amount of traffic they have. That help? I think so. There's a lot, there's a lot for the categories. I'm sorry. Right. They want, uh, Robert wants yeah. to know if he'd be allowed to go into a foreign terminal and request to pick off the bottom of their open board. If not on a category one or two, just on a regular dispatch. Yes. And if you look at the bottom of that, uh, that language on that, it says, uh, uh, you know, when we talked about that, at first, the company said they didn't want that to happen and I said you know you're looking for production so I'm a driver from Louisville that uh, I hit my dispatch on Monday morning and I decide I can't pick a, a category one or category two because I need to be home for my son's baseball game on Wednesday night so I'm going to just get a, get a load out and come back home so I can make the ball game now I get out and my wife called me and said it rained the ball game's not happening on Wednesday so I think, okay, now I'm gonna now I'm gonna pick away and I'm gonna run four loads and make full rate all the way around and then go home. So company, why wouldn't you want that to happen? And and they agreed. They said, look, if a guy gets out in the system and he wants to pick away, we will not stand in the way of anybody pulling those four loads to make full rate all the way around. Okay. Okay, it's jumping around. Um, Rex wants to know, this is regarding the PT agreement, if they had to be hiring drivers in a location to be utilizing the purchase transportation agreement. Uh, yes, Rick, they do. And if you look in there, uh, if you read through that, it, it clearly says it, that they have to be hiring, uh, attempting to hire, and they also uh, have to take any referrals that we give them. So. You know, we're, we do it all the time as local unions. And if you have uh, friends uh, that are looking for a good job, you know, if you refer them, they have to hire them if they're qualified, naturally. Okay. But they do have to be hiring to use PT. And, you know, and this one more thing I want to point out, if I didn't make it clear before, before they use PT, it's got to be approved by that local union. So, you know, all those, all those issues would be looked at. You know, if you're, if your board is shrinking and they're trying to use PT on you, I'm sure that your local union is going to say, you got to hire me some drivers before we uh, start thinking about letting somebody else haul our traffic, right? And and most, I think most terminals around the country right now are trying to hire, but that's a good question. And yes, they have to be hiring. Okay. Okay. Um, there was, um, let's see. Okay. 
there is some talk if you could explain the raises as far as like the cola okay there's yeah okay so if you uh look at the contract that we currently have the cola raises contained in article 23 uh we our economists studied this this uh formula that trips the the cola each year and actually we have the best triggering mechanism of any national contract out there our our triggering mechanism is lower which means that it trips faster than others uh our current cola was capped at 10 cents so no matter what the cpi said that it should be uh it was going to be 10 cents if you notice we got that raised to 50 cents cap so the color will apply uh, next year if, if the the cpi keeps going like it is it'll apply next year and the year after uh, all the way through 2025 at 50 cent maximum okay okay this is um let's see Skyler's asking if you can explain Article 82. Let me say that's a that is a drive away question. Chris, you want to take that one? Yeah, I have sure. Uh, Article 82, new Article 82, sections B1 and B2 are. are fairly simple and they they coincide with some decisions out of the central southern uh one is non-vaccinated drivers that dispatch at the home terminal and that is b1 in essence what it says is that you'll go into dispatch and you'll hold seniority regardless if you're vaccinated or unvaccinated up until the trigger point when a non-vaccinated driver forces a vaccinated driver on a Canadian load. Once that happens, the unvaccinated driver at that moment, wherever that's at on the dispatch on that day, uh, will either take a 600, lo 600 mile load or less. If there's not one available, he doesn't work. So it's really that simple on the B1. B2 is a non-vaccinated driver at dispatch at a backhaul terminal. And in, in essence, same principle. If two or more are at a dispatch at a backhaul terminal and nothing's affected as far as Canadian load, whether you're vaccinated or not vaccinated, you'll go in seniority order. But once that trigger happens where a junior non-vaccinated or a junior vaccinated employee is forced on a load because somebody's senior is non-vaccinated, I mean, reverse that but you get the point um then that driver who is not vaccinated who forced a senior person to a canadian load uh will be sent home and that should explain a or b1 and b2 thank you chris Okay. There's a lot of questions regarding the mechanics wages. Okay. It looks like, which can be viewed in the supplemental agreements that are posted to the website. Okay. Oh, they somebody's asking about the new language in the absenteeism. Okay, so yes, uh, absenteeism. So it's under Article 40, and there's a couple of different types of absenteeism. One is uh, excessive absenteeism and excessive tardiness. Uh, now, under the contract in Article 40, it simply says excessive, and there are about a dozen different types uh, are different definitions of excessive around the country. And I, I was surprised to learn that 
through my negotiations of all the different types that we had just amongst my committee. Uh, if you look at Article 40, Section 2, C and D, it says excessive absenteeism where notice is given after meeting with employee and excess of tardiness where notice is given after meeting with employee. So what we were seeing was a lot of cases coming to the committee with, with different uh, definitions of excessive. We, in, in, our, in my area, we enjoyed or we've been practicing uh, three occurrences of absenteeism or tardiness, uh, depending on which it fell under, within a rolling 30-day period. Uh, some places around the country, it was if you missed one, if you had one uh, issuance of absenteeism, they gave you a meeting. The second one day absenteeism, you got a reprimand. The third day of absenteeism, you got a one week off. And uh, excuse me, the, the third offense, you got discharged just for single days. So what we did was we got the companies to agree to the definition of excessive in both those sections. And it will be determined that three occurrences of either of those, depending on which one they're you're doing. If you're, if you're miss a whole day, it's absenteeism. If you're late, it's tardiness. Three occurrences of one of those in a 45 calendar day, rolling calendar day would get you one step is what we agreed to, to uh, have something uniform across the, the country. So if you have three, three uh, tardies in 45 days, you would have a joint meeting. The next time you had three tardies in 45 days, with if it was in six months of the first one, you would have a reprimand. If you had three more tardies within six months of the first offense, you'd get a one week. And all those are subject to instant to proven guilty. They would be processed to the to the panel when you got into time off and the panel would decide whether the company had a right to issue you uh, time off for violations. I hope that explains it. And Miles had a question if they would be updating the hotel list. Yes, another good question. You know that, you know, I didn't speak to a lot of the very good things that we got uh, in this contract. And I think everybody can agree to that. I know that we got some issues that people don't like, and I want you to understand those. That's why I wanted to spend time on those instead of talking about all the good stuff. But the lodging uh, is very big for our drivers. And if you look at those changes, you'll see that it says you no longer have to uh, provide your own card for incidentals to check in. The company's gonna give you that card uh, so that you're not putting your information all over the country. And secondly, they are going to develop a motel book list uh, or on your tablet, however they do it, that is uh, common to both carriers. Now, the language in there says that they will, they will uh, attempt to do it and uh, they're gonna need some help with that. And we're just the ones to help with it, right? So if you're, once this contract is ratified, if you're going down the road and you see what we've been seeing, that uh, one place may be loaded up with Jack Cooper and a Cassins guy don't have it on his list or vice versa. When that happens, we'll make those reports through your local union and we'll get those those uh, hotels added to everybody's book. If, if it's good for one company, it's good for the other. So we will, without a doubt, have to help them to develop that book, but we, we can do it. Good question. Okay. I think it's getting their main questions are now just back to like the category one and two, and then just, I don't know, just many questions. All right. And, you know, I, I don't know. I think I've been over that category one and two a couple of times. If there's something specific that I'm missing, uh, Jeff, maybe, or, or Chris, if you think that you, there's something that I haven't put out there, if you want to add to this, maybe to help them explain, uh, understand it, it'd be fine with me. 
No, no, uh, Avril, it's uh, Jeff Brilski. No, I think you've, you've covered it all. Um, again, you know, looking at the language, the way it is in the contract, I mean, it's pretty specific that you, you need to go out and you need to pull four loads once you leave your home terminal. That's the way you, you, you work around the new business rate. Right. Um, well, one, of the other, one of the other things, too, I just wanted to touch on, you know, when, when in regards to the COLA, um, you know, with the, con the, the date of the contract moving expiration date to um, August 31st, it still gives us room if there's still that type of, of cost of living increase in the final year of the agreement, we still could secure a wage increase in, in year, number, year number three. You know, and that's one one uh, one of the important things that we did in changing the COLA language. Right, and I'd also like to just add to what you said there, Jeff. You know, you said uh, that when you go out, you need to pull forward to break that to break your twenty-two, and that's correct. That's what it would do. It's you know, you wouldn't have to. You wouldn't be required to even on, on a one. You go out, and you're only required to pull one away. And after that, it's it's incentive. It's incentivized for you to pull up to four, so you can make full rate on everything if you get out if you pick a one and you go to fort wayne and you pick one away when you get empty with that load you got a right to tell the company to bring you back home and if they bring you back home back in the direction of your home terminal and you pull four loads on the way back in you know counting the the one up and the one away if you pull two more loads getting back home then you get you get four loads anyway and you get full rate but after the one on a one you are totally on your own. You're not required to do any more than one away on a one. All right. Any more? Avril, I, I, oh. I just want to step in. All right. Yeah. Avril, if you don't mind, it's Chris Taylor. Yeah. Uh, just want to step in on the, on the 48 uh, discussion on the one and two. Uh, just want to re just, just go over what you said, but maybe put a little more emphasis on it. So guys really understand that, it's 25% of the loads. And when we negotiated that, we really felt like senior drivers who wanted to get full rate for four loads would take that on Monday. That was the ideal. So if we have 21, uh, 21 dispatch or 22 dispatches, there will be five of those loads, right? And our thinking was that it's not going to be forced on a junior driver that a senior guy is going to take it. So I know there's some questions about seniority when, when you're breaking the one and two down, but it was really our thought process through that, that senior guys want to make full rate, going to make some tremendous gains and, and money would take those loads. Yeah, that's a very good point, Chris. And, and you're right. And we think, you know, just like with everything new that, that comes out, you know, I've had, I've had shuttles here in the Louisville area that, would come in and we put out a shuttle rate and uh, maybe the first time that it was bid out, nobody would take it because they thought they, there wouldn't be no money made on it. And as soon as they find out that, that somebody, you know, that there is money there then they take it. And I, and I really believe that, that this article 48 thing will turn into that. And uh, I think it'll be sought after, but you know, we'll wait and see, but I think it, I think it'll work that way. Now right, you got any more questions there? Okay, I think we can do like these seem like two kind of new good ones. Um, they want to know if there was anything addressed with the company punishing the drivers over CSA scores. Uh, yes, absolutely. If you look in, in the contract, we actually have language in there that, that uh, let me see if I can find it here real quick, <clears throat> addressing exactly that. And, uh, yes. I'm gonna make sure I get the right language here to you. Okay, so the new language under Article 40, Rule 8B, and the, the current language is failure to meet all requirements of state, local, state, and federal laws, reprimands to layoffs and discharges in aggravated cases. Now, as you know, the history of this, we, at my local, local 89, we had a driver that actually got fired for warning tickets and was taken to an arbitrator over a warning ticket that he was unable to uh, go to court and defend, you know, uh, himself. It's just something new that they're doing instead of giving a, a ticket that a guy can go and maybe have 
go to court and have it amended down. Uh, the troopers and DOT have started just giving warning tickets and then they assess a charge to our, our unionized companies and collect a big fee for CSA violations. So if you look in the, the contract language, we added a note. It says with regard to CSA warning tickets, the employers shall not issue discipline without independent objective evidence of the violation, which means that if a police officer gives you a warning ticket for, because he says you didn't have a seatbelt on and he has, it's only his word against yours, the company cannot give you discipline for that. If you get a speeding warning ticket under the uh, CSA and they give you a warning ticket, independent objective evidence would be the breadcrumbs off the truck. So if the company checks your breadcrumbs and you got a ticket for running 69 and a 55 and they check your breadcrumbs and it shows that you were running 69, then you would be subject to uh, discipline because that is objective proof or uh, objective evidence that you had a violation. But this stuff of getting written up for seat belts uh, and such as that is not objective and they will not be writing drivers up for that. Okay. Okay, I'm thinking um, someone would like to ask if you could clarify, clarify Article 5, Section 14 under seniority. Sure will. Article 5, Section 14, that, that actually, that proposal came from uh, an issue that we had in Kansas City, but it, it happened everywhere and it, uh, it probably will happen in other locations. So we, we're trying to get ahead of it. So the language says when the mode of transportation changes from single drive, yard, rail, or truck away at the same facility terminal, employees who were previously in that classification and who remain qualified will be allowed to follow the amount of work being transferred and dovetailed in order of terminal seniority, regardless whether this move involves the same company. So the, the specific incident that brought rise to this was we had CDL qualified drivers that uh, moved into the yard uh, to do yard work. When they got there after a certain period of time, uh, companies changed. So now there's two different companies on the yard. That driver traffic that he had followed in moved back to the truck and they would not allow the drivers to follow back. So this will allow uh, qualified employees to, when work is taken from their location move to another mode of transportation they will be able to follow that work if they are qualified okay any more questions let's see I'm thinking since a lot of them are getting maybe repetitive and after this, we'll be able to pull a list, we can respond, you know, kind of compile them and then respond back to them because some of them are having more individual instances. Right. Absolutely. Um, and it's yeah. hard to kind of clarify on a call with everybody. Right. And that's what we did today. You know, you had a, a question come into the division today and you sent it to me and I responded back immediately and, and I can, you know, I'm glad to do that. I'll, I'll be here at the hall tomorrow and I'll be glad to follow up with anybody that needs more clarification. That sounds perfect then. So yeah, if anybody, if your question hasn't been answered, you can feel free to type it in the Q&A section and then we'll be able to review and respond to them. Um, and you can also, if you need to email it um, after the webinar, to um, a earnest at teamster.org. Okay. You want me to close it up? I think so. I think we're good. Okay. So uh, once again, thanks to everybody that got on the call. Uh, it's a very important call. We are trying to be transparent with all that we've got, you know, as I said, we've got about 30 changes to the 
to the uh, contract and and uh, it would take a long time to put all that out there please take the time if you can to go to ibt.org look at the videos that we're going to post because it's got very detailed explanation on each article of the contract uh, jeff and chris i'd like for you to uh to help me close out when i get done here with with your opinion on the contract but i would like to just say that you know this is the most lucrative agreement in car hall history uh, please look at the total package and realize that negotiations are just that. Neither side always gets all that they want, but we did a lot better in this case than the company did. Believe me, we uh, we came out of this thing very well, and I personally and my committee and the two-man committee uh, ask that you vote yes on this contract and allow us to move forward with rebuilding this industry. Jeff and Chris, you want to speak? Thank you, Avril. Uh, yeah, Jeff Brilski, I just want to go on and just reiterate what you've already said, Avril. This is uh, the best collective bargaining agreement brought, ever brought back to the car hall uh, group. And um, as the general secretary treasurer said, when we concluded negotiations in, in Romulus, you know, we've done our part. Uh, now it's, 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 it's up to the IBT to go out and take this agreement that, that we bargained and, and use it to organize new groups. So I strongly recommend a yes vote on this. And I thank you for your hard work. Chris. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, Avril and Jeff both alike. Uh, this is Chris Taylor, uh, drive away chair, but uh, they did a hell of a job. Our members in negotiations did a hell of a job. Uh, the committee did a hell of a job. The drive away committee did a hell of a job. And, you know, Carl in the West, Bill East, um, had Eric and Ted out of 413. Frank, my man out of 745. Uh, just can't thank everybody enough. Uh, I just want to close out with this to make sure that all my Renton, Chillicothe, and Denton drivers, and even the guys in the East understand that uh, anything we changed in the Central Southern Supplement, uh, and if you hear the video, I, I mentioned some articles in the West, but any changes we made will be covered in the West, will be covered in the East. All those changes are, are through the, you know, almost like a national contract, but uh, we, we made the appropriate changes in each region. So uh, with that, Avril, uh, appreciate, appreciate you. All right, thank you, Chris and Jeff. And yes, that, that was a very good point that you made, Chris. We, most all the questions tonight were uh, around the Central Southern. Uh, we haven't forgot our brothers on the, on the east and the west coast, and we certainly haven't forgot our driveway guys. Uh, any questions from anybody, please let us know. And as Chris said, all the all the major parts of the central southern stuff bled right over into the east and the west. So we've got a, a package for everybody. And uh, Amanda, I think, and Bill, I think with that, we're uh, ready to close the meeting. Amanda.